uh, the program and everything. And I teach in Van Meter. Um, we're a trio of three. We have a K-12 Spanish building. And um, it's great. I love it. And so I um, love presenting. I tend to talk really fast, so I'm going to try to keep it slow. And I had extra coffee. They gave us these great Starbucks coffees. And I already had like a big iced coffee, but then I saw this and I was like, oh, I got to have it. So I did. I'll try to slow down. But it's a good thing because I have 28 slides and what, 50 minutes? So I was wondering if I could have a timer who's really good at figuring out about how many minutes I should spend on each slide. And if I'm really starting to fall behind, give me a signal. Is there somebody who wants to be that person? Who? Yeah. Yes. OK, perfect. All right. Um, I, w I don't want to like talk about myself too much because there's more interesting stuff than that. So um, what I've noticed is that when I'm teaching, I'm not really clear in my expectations and my kids just blurt out all the time. And I thought, well, that probably is an issue that we all have because of the nature of our classroom. So that's what this presentation is about. And I think it's, I've geared it towards K-12. You can use these ideas in any situation, but if you feel like you already have this under control and you want to go check out another session, I'm totally And I'm not on there very often, but I want to be. So if I get tweeted, then I'll get on more often. Then I'll, I wanted to tweet Crash, and he said something today that was fantastic. Mentally preparing in my sleep for the presentation that I was about five minutes in, and all of a sudden the door opened. wheeling in his table, really, singing in like these bigger than life cellos and all kinds of instruments. And I got all disconcerted. I'm like, okay. And he's like, if that actually happens. <laughs> well, and if it, and then you know what I was going to do? I was going to go up to him and say, hey, why don't you like come to the room and open the door, like rattle it and walk in after I've said that? And then everybody would be like, oh. And I saw him, but he was in the little staff room, you know, like kind of coming down off of his presentation. I thought, no, oh, I don't want to be that person that goes and bothers him. So I didn't. OK. So <clears throat> um, why do they blurt in our classes? Um, because of the nature of our classroom, we have a communicative room. And we want them, we make a platform where students feel comfortable saying, blurting out whatever they want to say, but they don't understand the boundaries. We don't necessarily set the boundaries. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, over the years, I've noticed um, that students are, are confused. And we allow it sometimes, and sometimes we don't. So what I've started doing is to make my expectations really transparent, and then just practice, practice, practice. We have to remind them constantly. Um, also, if you have ideas. And I forgot to get these out. But if you have ideas or questions, then I have some post-its. And you can pass those around. Maybe I have post-its. And we'll collect those at the end. And we can go through as many of those. And I will add them to the presentation. OK, I have one thing of post-its. I thought I had more. Um, I'll keep looking. Ooh, do you have post-its? Oh, yay. Oh, I didn't know that. OK. And then I can, I can add that right into the presentation at the end. And so I'll share the bit.ly after. I'm not going to share it before because I've got a few little surprises that if I were out there, I would jump ahead and kind of ruin the surprise. So I don't want to do that. OK, so the first thing I want to do is identify the types of responders that we have in our classroom. Um, the students you might or might not have experienced in your classroom um, will discuss the characteristics of each responder and how to successfully curb their blurting without squashing their spirit. Um, Compromising the and compromising the integrity of your classroom. Responder, the responder, the HTTE responder, and the Katab or responder. Those are all the different types of responders in the classroom. So our first 
and think about it. Wait for it. Okay. Um, what do you think? Has to be the first. What? How did you know that? Did you get? That was excellent. Nice job. Okay. Has to be first. <laughs> did you notice who raised their hand and went? Mm, mm. <laughs> okay. You might recognize some of these in your classroom. We might recognize some of these in this room. You might recognize them as yourself. <laughs> okay, so kind of going along the same lines. Oh, I didn't talk about that one. Hang on, I gotta go back to that one. So the has to be first responder. This is the student who has to answer before everyone. And this student may or may not even be aware of his HTBF status in the group. If you allow this student to dominate when answering questions, eventually all of the other students will fall silent and stop listening. They won't communicate. So we need to address that responder. Oops, oh no. Did you see it? Okay. All right, so the HTBL responder the HTBL, think about it for a moment. Oh, actually, this is it, sorry. Yes, oops, yep, that was it. Okay, ready? Has to be last. Has to be last, okay. Do we have a has, I don't think we probably have a has to be last responder in here. Um, the has to be last responder, what's that? Maybe we do, maybe we just haven't discovered yet. <laughs> okay, the has to be last. This is the student who always has to have the last word, and sometimes it's not the last word, it's the last clap. You know, after everybody's clapped and they've got to be that last one, okay? Um, this student is usually aware of his or her HTBL status in the group. If you allow this student to respond later than other students, it will quickly become cool and other students will vie for that status. The HTBF responder usually views the HT, okay, so the HTP, HTBF responder has to be first, usually views the HTBL responder that has to be last responder as completely and utterly incompetent. The next responder is a responder. This is my personal, this one is really hard for me. We'll see. Okay. Okay, so this is your mispronounces on purpose, oh. right? All my questioners are in front of the room, and I say something, one of the students, and it's always one in every classroom, goes, quay? And they all say quesadilla. May have gotten goosebumps. And we went to this restaurant nearby, Los Tres Amigos. And the um, server comes around and he says, "Oh, I'd like uh, cheese quesadilla." And then he went, "Quesadilla, quesadilla." And I just looked at him like, "I told you this was going to happen, and now it has. You guys stop." So he sees the direct result enough. Incorrect input is going to mess them up. So this is the student who mispronounces words on purpose. This student is either aware of his MOP status in the group or has acquired mispronunciation from the aware MOP students in your classroom. <coughs> if you allow this student to mispronounce words, other students will soon consciously or subconsciously gain MOP status. Then you have the HTTE. Any guesses on that one? No? Okay. Ooh, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. You are super close. That was amazing. Has to, what do we teach? Has to tra translate. Yes. Has to translate everything. This is the student who translates everything you say. This, this status happens organically when blurting is allowed. The student is extremely apologetic when addressed, not realizing that the behaviors are unsolicited. If you allow this student to continue to translate everything you say, your other students will tune you out and wait, wait for the HTTE responder to translate for them. A common quote you might hear from a student sitting near the HTTE is, I don't know Spanish, and that's true. They don't, because they're not listening to you anymore. 
they're listening to the translator. Okay. Okay. The ah yagets responder. Oh, mine are out of order. There it is. So I heard always, or oh, okay, there's no always. What you're going to say. This is the student who tries to figure out what you're going to say, no matter the language, and then you do. Text. Incorrect. When a lot of other students in the classroom acquire inaccurate and sometimes hilarious language. Be careful not to allow the ayagets. Brilliant kid who sits right towards the front and I'll start to say something and he'll just blurt out what he thinks he's going to say and I really have to kind of pull him aside and say, every time. I'm going to address to curb these blurters um, once we go through our different styles of blurting. So the next one is the HTLE Kiki, is what I meant to say when I said that one. Oh, That's you know this one. Know. How do you know this? <laughs> I, I, thought, I know, I thought I was being so clever. I'm like, they're never going to get these. That's so great. So this is the student who waits for um, oh, no, I have the wrong notes here. Okay, this is the student, oh, no, no, this is right. This is the student who waits for everyone else to respond, most commonly known as the um, knew it person, followed by a fist pump. Okay, they might not say it, but they wait till everybody else has responded, and they need to let you know that they knew what the answer was, even though maybe they didn't. Um, depending on the student, if not addressed, the HTL key key symptoms are highly contagious and plague your classroom, depending on the age. It doesn't happen so much in high school, but um, elementary, middle school, it's a constant. Yes! After you do every question, like, let's say you, I, you, you didn't guess it out loud. I had you keep it in your head. If one person starts going, oh, I got it. And I, I, kind, of, I kind of am that person, I'm going to admit. Like, I want the person in front to know that I knew it, and so I do the nod. Oh, yeah. I want you to know that I knew it, because I'm right with you right there. So it's pretty common, even in adults. OK, so the next responder, OK, we'll see. This is kind of fun. Who's going to get this one? Oh, I don't know if you're going to get this one. I can give you a clue. Because the oh my gosh, yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I know. It's like your teachers or something, right? Um, yeah, knows the answer but refuses to participate. So this student is not a blurter. On the contrary, this is the student who knows the answer but refuses to participate. There are a variety of reasons for the resistance. Maybe they don't want to draw attention to themselves. They're too cool. They're not cool. They lack the confidence. You sim but you simply cannot allow <coughs> this RTP, Caturbit Epidemic, um, extremely difficult to rem remedy. Do you remember what the Caturbit one was? Maybe I don't know. Oh, no. I'll put that one on the very same one. Oh, that was it. Never mind. This over the years, as you probably have too, is we can't push them um, because compelling. Um, he didn't say like necessarily interesting or fun, but if it's not engaging for them, they're going to shut down. And if we turn it into a discipline thing constantly, then they're going to shut down. They're not going to want to participate. So it's, it's good to keep it positive. And so how do we address them in a positive way? Um, connect with your students outside of class. This one, depending on the student, can be difficult because you have the one that's just really difficult. 
and you it's it's hard in class because they're constantly so I have one in particular um, who he struggles to stay inside his own body he just has so much energy and it's he just can't sit still and so I give him a piece of paper and I have him draw and that actually helps but sometimes other things come out you know so it's hard to teach when this is happening um, so I try to relate to him outside of class. I can't reach him in class always, but if I start connecting with him, with him outside of class, it makes a big difference. Like in the hallway, scouts, whatever it is that he's in, and ask lots of questions. <clears throat> Notice what they've changed. Oh, you got braces. Oh, you got glasses. Oh, your skirt's really cool today. Whatever it is that you can say to them. And one thing I think that helps, and I have a hard time doing this too, is waiting outside your classroom before class starts and greeting them at the door and you might do the password you might not do the password um, but if <laughs> if you don't then you can just have a quick exchange and even if it's a I'm outside my classroom so I can use English with you or I can do it in the target language because you have acquired that language and we can use it or you're doing the password so they can use it too <clears throat> what you allow to happen in your classroom will, con will continue so anything that you let go once is going to keep happening, especially if somebody sees it. It's contagious. I kind of lost my place in here. Here we go. Okay. <clears throat> Define your training. Um, beginning of each year. Those are what I use with my students. And then I tell them exactly how I want But I never really told them why. And so they weren't invested in care. It's just, well, that's what we're supposed to do, and maybe I'll do it, or maybe I won't. Um, so you don't have to type everything. It'll be a bit.ly, and you can just grab it from there, or you can type it, too. Um, we are going to practice. will stop processing one by one and eventually only one student will respond for everyone or on the contrary if I allow one student to not respond they drop off one by one well Sally's not responding why do I have to respond if she's not responding and that's typical at the high school level not so much the elementary and middle school because they're still people pleasers but once they get to high school they kind of start dropping off and if you let one not answer they notice right they notice and they stop participating um, and then in the end, you'll just have that one voice that talks for everybody, and then everybody else is disengaged. Oh, gosh, see, I am, I'm slow. Thank you. <laughs> so my different responses that I have them practice are individual responses, choral responses, finish my phrase, vote response, and no response, and I practice those. So I use the target language to signal responses. I use American Sign Language, just I don't know American Sign Language. I don't know it. I'm learning little bits and pieces as I go, and it's not fluent American Sign Language, but the way that I figure it is I used to say, there is a cloud, and I would sign using something that looked like what I thought it would be, and then I thought, they're going to go outside of my class, and they're going to, they do. They use your gestures outside of class, especially um, if it's a song and you've gestured a song. They start doing it. Um, or when they can't think of the word and they're doing a speaking, they do this before the word comes to them. So I thought, well, they can't use that outside of the classroom. I'm giving them something that's useless for the rest of their lives. I mean, it's good for Spanish, but they can't use it. So I started looking up different phrases, and <coughs> I went to handspeak.com, and they have great just one-word um, signals that you can give kids. So... Um, what I do is I tell them, this is exactly what I say to them, and it can be in your tiger language, depending on the level of your kids. These are the signals I'm going to use so you know how and when I would like you to answer questions. And I do have a little video of me doing this with kids a little bit later. We might not have time for it, but it's in the presentation. So, if I can remember these now, the problem is, is my students, I presentation that I want because I get them mixed up sometimes. I think this is... Maybe, oh no, this is, wait, what, let's, let me,
um, name of the dog, and I'll do this, and I'll say, um, wait, wait, target language, and then when I'm ready, but I looked up answer, and that's this. So it's still, you know, it's like your turn to talk. It's your turn to talk. So that's. Oh my gosh. Back up to where you are. Command option arrow. Let's write it down. Okay. So. Oh. Oh, did it not? Oops. Oh no. Wait. Don't go to Ocho. Ocho. Stop. Okay. So I just hit present. We'll just go back into present. Okay. All right. Will it start where I was? Yep. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. So, and you can click on all these links individually when you get the bit.ly. So answer, I said. So answer, um, raise your hand. Excited was this. I started to do that earlier when I was trying to say wait. Um, silent, which makes sense. We usually do this. I mean, why not just give them the sign? Um, all together, I think that was something like this. I'll have to look that one up again because I used to do that, which means everyone, but there's a different sign. We can look it up or not. Vote. So I do a lot of, when I, when I do story asking, I do a lot of voting. Because if you, when I allow them to blurt, it gets out of hand in my classroom. So I try to control the blurting that way. So vote. Now, if you're in high school, this might be a little suggestive, but you've got two fingers together. So hopefully they're not going to be like, oh, or even middle school sometimes. But elementary, you're safe. Any elementary teachers? Oh, good. Yay. Okay. I also do. I used to do everything. Now I do just elementary. So this is um, vote, which you're putting your little vote in the box. Um, if you want to say a negative, so don't yell. That's what I um, use for blurt because I looked up blurt in handspeak and I couldn't. It wasn't there. So I say don't yell. No grites. No grites. And then don't translate. Translate was this. So don't translate. And that's what you can use, and I'll talk about this soon. That's what you can use with your translators, is a subtle reminder. And to everybody, too. Um, so this, uh, I don't know if I have time to play. I'll just kind of put a little portion of it. This is what I and started using. So I tell the students in Spanish, uh, how many people do Spanish? How many people don't do Spanish? If it works. Uh, back up. Did I miss it? Oh. You're gonna wait, so that'd be wait. so va a esperar, va a esperar. Until I make a gesture, and I used to know gesture, but I don't remember now. So that would be espera, espera, espera. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, so I'll pause it right there. And I'm going to talk about this in a moment. So one thing that I do too is finish the phrase. And I think, I don't think I address that anywhere in the slideshow. So I'll talk about that now. Um, I'll say the phrase in Spanish. And if I know they don't know the word, I'll start the phrase for them so that they can figure it out according to context. And then I'll repeat it lots. So that's one way that I want them to respond in chorus. And so for them to know that you want them to respond in chorus, it's answer. Or they know according to your body language because they just get used to that's what you do. Oops. Okay. <coughs> so how do you handle your various responders? Once you've established the routines and signals in your classroom, um, I don't know if I went through all the different, so individual response, that's raise your hand. So you would do the raise your hand, okay. Um, Choral response, everybody all together. So that was the, I think it's, 
I want to say it's this. You can look that up on Handspeak. Did you look it up? No, I just. Oh, you know it? Okay. It could be that, but the one I this everyone together was something like this. Okay. Oh yeah. And there are a lot of variations too. So I looked it up, and you have to kind of scroll down and make sure you have the right one too. Um, but I figure even if it's not necessarily the right one, it's closer than what I was doing. Um, another one is vote response. So I say in Spanish, we are going to vote. And I'll say, what does that mean? We're going to, yep, well, I did it in English to English. But they know what I want them to do. And so then that, better. Take three suggestions and they have to write, levanta la mano, raise your hand, don't blurt them out, I don't let them blurt. Um, but they might have ideas that they want to share. And so then if you have a lot of participation, and kind of, you know, go around the room, because if you know somebody has a response, especially in high school, that's inappropriate. You know, the number. The oh, okay. Can I say it? We're on video here. It's a town. Come on. Okay, it's called Coming, Coming, Iowa. So when I taught seniors, they they were like, oh, yeah, they're from coming. And I went, I, I know what you're doing. So it was, it was uncomfortable. Anyway, so I do the teen marine de dos pingües. And I might go around the room and skip that one person who I know is going to say something inappropriate. Can we, like, scratch that part out of there? <laughs> I shouldn't have brought it up. Okay. Um, let's see. I know. I always do that. Oops. No longer student friendly. 20 minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to go back to my notes here. How to handle. So um, it, this is when if you have ideas other than what I'm saying to put down, like how to curb the student blurting, please write those down and I'll add them at the end of the presentation. Um, so here's how I curb the has to be first responder in order to, man <laughs> in order to avoid the manifestation uh, of the HTBF in your classroom. Um, it's best to speak early on, as with all of them, as your whole class, to talk about why it's important to wait for the cue to respond. And you have to be really consistent with that cue that you're going to give them. So if it's raise your hand, um, you can have your own gestures that you use for that. But be really consistent and really clear. The problem is, is if you allow them to blurt and then you don't give them a, clue or a cue and they blurt out again, they don't, they don't know. And if it happens a lot and you get irritated, it's more on you than it is on them, and I've done it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to go through some ideas, and then if you guys have some ideas too. So the first thing that I do is address the class as a whole, and we practice, practice, practice at the beginning of the year. Um, if it's this, if it's your has to be first student, I just make subtle eye contact with that student and sign the wait cue. that a certain student's going to want to blurt it out. So subtly, I'll just kind of look and, like, you know, remember to wait. Like, I might catch them in the hallway before class. Remember, I'm going to give you the clue today or the key. To the hallway, other things. So that it's not just behavior issues if you're talking to them in the hallway before class. <clears throat> Because this one, um, have the last ways or whatever it is, depending on the age, um, and they seek attention. And when you address their behavior, you're rewarding that. That's what they're looking for. So, um, did I forward this yet? That has to be last. Yeah. So, um, 
during class, if they're doing that has to be last, a lot of times I won't necessarily make eye contact because that's a reward too and I might just address the class as a whole and say things like, um, hey, I need your help. This, this is like in the hallway, but it's always a little after everyone else. And if you say this, <laughs> I've had this work before. I'm a little worried that you're not a